it's important to know that these things can change. So how do we get this on and off uh, or signal and reference uh, uh, power rings? Well, basically there are many strategies, <clears throat> some of which involve actually switching the location at which you're looking, such as doing on and off observing, beam knowing or sub beam knowing, like they very, very described very well. And there's also a possibility of actually switching the frequency of your observations. You can do this in band, meaning like you're only switching a small amount, so all your signal still lies within your spectral window. Or you can do out of band uh, switching where you completely shift out of your observing spectral window. Um, of course, what the best uh, alternative is for your side things uh, depends on that. Um, they gave some very, uh, yeah, some, some tips about how to pick this. And of course, there are some options here uh, which are not covered here, and you're also welcome to uh, talk with your project friend and your collaborators to come up with combinations of these strategies so you can uh, make your science possible. For example, you could think about doing on and off with frequency switching, uh, as an example. So what do these things mean? Well, on and off, like the name says, is basically observing first uh, your source and then going off your off source to obtain an off spectra. And why you would want to do this? Well, basically, if you're observing, for example, a point source, your own position will contain the temperature of the source, sort of the system temperature. But when you observe off source, you won't have the temperature of the source. And then it's really clear that if you subtract the on minus the off, you should get rid of most of the system temperature. Again, that's not going to be perfect, but uh, it does a very good job. In Astrid, uh, this is uh, called as on on off. It's the name of the procedure. And uh, if you look at the observer's guide, you have have a better list of all the available options for these things. I'm not going to go into detail into that. And uh, some of the considerations to have here is that the off region should not have emission or absorption, especially like if you want to observe a spectral line, for example, you want to make sure that yeah, there's no emission in the off position because then you would be subtracting this from your spectral line and you would end up with a biased measurement. You also want to make sure that you're doing this often enough that you can uh, account for uh, changes in the atmosphere and the uh, telescope's gain. And just from uh, experience, um, if you're observing like narrow spectral line features, you can do this every so uh, every few minutes below 10 gigahertz. And like Dave said, you might want to do this faster above. And that's usually easier if you have uh, multiple beams contest, because then you can just switch between beams and you don't really need to actually move the telescope as much. Um, again, like uh, picking up from what Dave said, this is usually useful if you're observing broad spectral lines, um, or if you are observing in a source with a crowded spectrum where frequency switching is not usually, uh, will probably not give you the best results because uh, your line is too broad or there's too many lines to know how to place the, how to move the frequency, and you might want to do this. Some of the inconveniences, of course, is that you're going to lose some time because you have to move the telescope to a new position and you have to know roughly where to point your telescope. Uh, you have to know in which regions you do not expect to have emission. So that requires some a priori knowledge. And uh, of course, uh, the farther away you are and the more different your on and off regions are, um, when you make the subtraction, you're going to end up with residual phase lines in your spectrum. So then there's the other technique of frequency switching, where you basically tune the local oscillator um, to switch the frequency at which uh, your observations are uh, digitalized. So this in practice just means that your spectra is going to be switched uh, slightly in frequency with an, uh, the exact amount uh, you set up, you decide how much you're going to switch them. And then what you do is you take the difference between these two spectra, the 
the frequency switch in the work in the non-frequency switch. So for this reason, it's important that you know where your line is going to be because you don't want to subtract your line from itself. Or if your line is too broad, you have to know how broad it is. Um, so you move the, the spectra uh, sufficiently away. Again, the off region should not have emission or absorption. Uh, this is usually used for observations of narrow spectral lines. Uh, because when it's easier, you can use small frequency shifts which also results in the best, uh, those are the best results because um, you are, um, yeah, because since you're moving everything just a little, the properties of the signal and the reference spectrum are very similar. And as I mentioned, some of the drawbacks, you need to know a bit about, a bit more about your source a priori. Um, the shift is too large, then the, the signal and reference spectrum are not so similar. So you end up with a larger residual baseline. And since you're subtracting uh, all of the continuum on the same position, and the, the continuum is not going to change that much, or it's a small delta, delta in frequency, you end up without a uh, continuum. So now, what is this uh, the calibration temperature? It's basically the temperature of a noise diode, which is injected into your uh, into a signal chain at a particular point and this the way this is done is uh, in a flickering fashion so basically if you're tracking a source what happens is uh, you're recording a spectrum without the noise diode and then the next one you inject the noise diode on so you have this sort of pick out uh, pick out pick out pick out uh, sequence which enables you to calibrate your spectrum um, <clears throat> Now, if you were also to combine this with frequency switching, for example, you would have a P, P call, uh, and then also like a reference P and a reference P call. So some notes on this uh, calibration temperature. So by default, if you observe, uh, you can just go directly and observe your source and the data will contain some information on this uh, temperature value and uh, what the call is. Uh, however, um, you only get one value, which is for the noise uh, diodes and the GVTs, usually a reasonable assumption. But uh, the import, uh, more problematic is the fact that you don't really know when this was measured. And we do know that the temperature of the noise diodes can change. So it's very important to perform observations of a calibrator source yourself, uh, using the same setup as your uh, observations, as your science observations, basically. So this is an example, for example, where uh, Godi and the group of current masters compare the basically the temperature that's registered in the metadata of the SD fits files that the, the GVT saves once you do an observation against what they would measure for the uh, calibration temperature using uh, absolute uh, calibration using astronomical sources. And you can see that the ratio is not one, which would be the ideal case, but it's rather 1.2. It's very stable with time, um, but it is different than what you would have obtained by if you didn't perform these calibration observations. So, um, how do you measure uh, this calibration temperature? Well, you basically <clears throat> would do on and off observations of a calibrator source. And in general, these calibrators should have a known uh, flux density at your observing frequency. So you can uh, basically convert your, uh, the power you're measuring into temperature units or flux density units uh, without using the, the noise dial. It should be stable in time, uh, ideally, or if you can uh, basically know the flux density at the time of your observation, that's also fine. And uh, it's also important that it be point-like. You don't want to have to, you don't want to observe something that has a lot of structure or that's larger than, the, than your beam, because then um, you would have to model these effects. Uh, so the, the easiest case is just something that's small compared to your beam. So that way you can just uh, calibrate uh, under the assumptions of a point-like source and uh, how to choose some of these calibrator sources. 
Um, usually for frequencies below 50 gigahertz, you can look at the Perlian Butler catalog. It's also uh, an older catalog by Ott. Um, and they would basically provide the flux density for your source. They would tell you about its size, its properties, if it's changing or not. And at the higher frequencies, what people usually do is uh, look at the ALMA database of calibration observations. So now I'm um, going to jump into GVT IDL, which is basically the software reduction package supported by the observatory. Like Larry mentioned, uh, it's locally available. So once you can access FastX or uh, the GVO reduction machines, you just type in GVT IDL and that should launch the GVT IDL session. And it has been mainly assigned to spectral line data reduction. Um, there is some support for continuum uh, data reduction, but it's not really, it doesn't do anything uh, great for you. Like, there are, it doesn't know about uh, data reduction routines, I mean, continuum data reduction routines. It does do a very good job for uh, spectral line observations. It knows about most of the observing modes uh, we have discussed. So, for example, if you do an on and off, you can do this, you can use this command get ps. Uh, basically get position switch data, or if you're doing frequency switch observations, you can do a get fs command, get frequency switch data. And the code and its documentation are located here. Just here, just that um, I won't have the time to go over all of it, so you'll certainly want to look there or ask your friend. So I'm just gonna do this uh, with examples. So I was hoping you guys would be able to uh, Login into the machines and, and follow along, but uh, you just have to trust me. Um, so Larry just showed how to use the online command, which would basically uh, populate uh, the IDL using the data that's currently being saved by Vega or the latest project that uses Vegas. By using offline, we can instead uh, specify any project we like that's, that's on this. For projects which are less than two years old, they should still be staged in the SDPs area of the of the uh, computers. So you can just specify the project name, the project ID, sorry, underscore, and the session number, and that will basically load that project. Then again, you can use summary to give the contents of the file. It's being shown here. Um, so that's the offline command, sorry about this being so small. And then when you use summary, it will just list all the contents of that file. Then you can do a command like get position switch and the scan number and the, the plotter window will appear. And this will just uh, get uh, for scan six, it will get scan six and the reference using the off, uh, the corresponding off uh, scan. Just here, or maybe you cannot, but um, just the sequence here, the sequence number. So one would be for the on and two for the off. And then you could, for example, smooth it using a Gaussian kernel of a width of 10 channels. So, yep, this is uh, how the plotter looks like. Uh, the idea was here to make you guys uh, do this and just figure out what the source velocity is. And what I wanted to point out is that the plotter window, besides showing you a spectra, also has uh, options up here. So for example, if you were to click here on this uh, GFS uh, button, it will give you the option of changing the spectral axis to velocity units or other frequency units. So it can be quite handy if you're doing a quick look at your data. Um, any questions so far? I wrote a question in the chat about the uh, the frequency switching, mm -hmm. um, but I can say it a lot. <laughs> I was asking if uh, is if there is a minimum uh, bandwidth that we need to do frequency switching, and um, if we can do it in all the Vegas mode modes or only a, a few of the the wider ones. Or I think you can do it in any of the Vegas modes, and I'm not sure what's the minimum. Uh, frequency shift you can use. 
it might be limited by the just by the channel size in, or the, the low solution but we can go over that um, by the end but yeah I don't think that's yeah I don't think that's something to I don't think it's a practical limitation to science but we can ask Dave yeah uh, you can switch in any of the modes I mean obviously you want to switch wider than your line <laughs> because you don't want to switch line on line um it, the system will there is a minimum in terms of but it's so tiny it'd be that by the lo and it would be a fraction i mean a really really small shift so you can move the lo a really really small number but you need to switch wider than your line so you're not switching on top of it so uh, and you can switch on any of the modes there are people that use broadband modes and will switch and have multiple lines <laughs> that have frequency switching as long as their line that they care about aren't stepping on each other. But you do have to worry about your lines. And some, like if you're doing galactic stuff, it could be different velocity structures too. So even if your lines are narrow, you might have multiple velocity components. So you need to know something about your your source and the, uh, your underlying spectra and making your frequency switch sizes. The smaller you switch, arguably a little better, but it actually works pretty well. You can, you can, if need be, you can switch a good fraction um, at quite a bit of um, bandwidth. You can switch for extra galactic lines. It's <laughs> really wide, no banding. That worked okay, um, actually. Thanks for the, for the clarification, Dave. Pedro, um, can I add one point uh, here? that I have seen the opposite of that example, where in a very crowded uh, with interference field, person had uh, switched off into inadvertently got into an RFI reader area as the frequency reference. And all those RFI were coming in a very complicated way into the band. So if you are in a band where you expect RFI be very careful, by for how much you shift, shift by, and it's not just your line width, you have to be aware of the surrounding frequency space as, as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks a lot, Tafasuri. Yeah, so you so there's two things there like you have to be aware that you don't shift over your line, and also be aware of the environment if there are more lines or if there's RFI close to your line, you want to switch the RFI on top of your line or bring the RFI into your reference spectra. So it's good to be aware of these things. Thanks a lot, Dave uh, and Tapasi. <clears throat> For the second example, I wanted to uh, first introduce the use of uh, routines, which basically enable you to capture, uh, to put your code into a reusable manner. Uh, if you're familiar with IDL, this is uh, mainly just IDL syntaxes. So you can define a routine by doing uh, row, the name of the routine, and then you can pass it uh, options. And then inside this, you can write uh, all of your commands and then you close it with an end. Um, you save this as a text file. In this case, we we'll call this average uh, underscore rscg.pro. And if you put this in your home directory, uh, in the GVT IDL Pro folder, which you have to create, GVT IDL will automatically look for uh, scripts or routines in this folder. So you can uh, compile them and use them uh, from anywhere you're working with. You can also save this in your current working directory. Um, but um, yeah, it's. Uh, Often it's good to keep all these things in one place so you can use them for multiple projects. And this particular routine, what it does, it simply is going to take um, all the scans from the previous example. So it has, it's not uh, like an entirely general routine in that sense, uh, but it will take all the scans from the previous example, um, do the position switching calibration, then and then average them together. So how that goes is, well, first we do this as clear, which will clear all the accumulators, which are these internal variables that the idea uses to store your data. And 
we're also going to issue a freeze command, which basically is just going to keep the plotter from auto-updating, because then otherwise every time we do uh, any uh, command with our spectra, it's going to try to work plotter. And just for convenience, we don't want that to happen. And then it's a simple for loop that starts at scan start, goes to scan end, and uh, increments by two, because we are um, doing this on and off. And so if you remember from the summary, the first scan is the on, the second scan is the off, and then the third scan is on again, and the fourth scan, fourth scan is off. So you don't really need to do the get position switch uh, all of the, in the off uh, spectra, you only need to use in the on spectra and it will automatically know which off spectra to use. That's why we're uh, flipping by two. And then for each one of those, it just gets the position switch data. And then it uses this ACUM command, which basically tells it to put the spectra in this, uh, this container that will then be used to average the data. So once this is done, we issue an average command, which will take all the data that's in this ACUM container and average it together. And the way it does it is using the combination of the system temperature and the, um, the integration time per scan as weight. Um, Can I ask a question about this? Yes, of course. Um, so it looks like the ACUM and average commands sort of just apply to whatever object GBTIDL is like currently holding. Yes. Somehow, can you command it to do that to a specific object rather than whatever the current current thing is? Uh, that's an excellent question, and honestly, I I think it's possible. I don't know how to do it myself, but maybe the capacity of the, you know. Um, you, GBT idea, yeah, the current container, you run operations on them, you can move things to other containers. You can have multiple cum buffers going, too. You have a cum that you can have another accumulation buffer, but it's how it's configured to run. So you go through and you put stuff in a, in a current, um, in like that zero container. So you'll loop through it and it gets it and you, you accumulate it together, but it's not averaging at that point. The average will. Yeah, the average is lower down, but could you assign it to like, you make two loops, one for one that makes a cum and one that makes a cum two. Yeah. And then could you assign it to average a cum and then average a cum two? Um, yeah, so let's, you could, <laughs> you could loop through things and there's uh, four cum buffers, zero, one, two, three, I believe. Um, and then you can average those accumulate buffers and then you could, you could uh, accumulate your averages too. Mm, interesting. Okay. Um, yeah. Sort of, so yeah, you work in containers. Sometimes what, well, I work, you can work in, it's set up, it, it put in containers. So you can do some sub processing and copy it, um, from the current container, which is zero to another container and then copy that container back to the current container. And oh, okay. Simulate it. Yeah, so, that makes sense then. Yeah. So that's, it's a little clunk, clunky or old school. It, it's, it seems natural to me, but that's because it was built on Unipops and Unipops as well was the NRAO used to use for the 12 meter and 140 foot, you know, 30 years ago. Um, I I've used weirder stuff for astronomy. I mean, it's fine. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, that, so there's ways to save it. You save it in buffers, basically. But when you're processing it, you bring it back to the what we call container zero or the active pointer or whatever or metadata, the data, and then you can um, process it there. Okay. Thanks, Dave. And um, yeah, we can. I'll try to get a, a good example for that, for when we do data reduction in the, in the group. And we can go over that in more detail. Thanks for the question. Um, so yeah, the way you would then run this is you would uh, give it the idea, you would tell it, okay, when is this project offline? And you have to actually compile the procedure. So in this case, since this is a very ingenuity ideal pro folder, uh, 
activity ID will know what to do. So you just do this dot R, the name of the proceed, the pro uh, file, and then you just call it uh, average uh, this redshift survey of compact groups and uh, the start scan and the end scan. And then since we have freeze the display, we have to tell it to show it to us. It will pop up this uh, plotter window. You can, again, smooth it using the Gaussian kernel. Since it's still freezed, uh, we have to do the show commands uh, for it to update. And then we can actually save the results using the file out command. So basically, once you call this file out command, um, and give it a file name, which has to be a fix file. Um, every time you issue a keep command, it will go into this uh, fix file. And uh, yeah, so you can also do things with the plotter window. If you wanted to zoom into a spectra, for example, you can use your middle click, uh, select the area around the, select the area of interest, and that will zoom in into your line so you can see the details better. And have one more example, uh, where basically um, it's similar to a previous one, but in this case, I'm assuming that the observation is uh, a mapping observation, so that then we have to process every integration separately. So we're not going to uh, work on uh, each scan, but on in each scan and on each integration, and we're going to save the results to uh, a different file. In this case, it's just a doll for loop. The other loop is the same as before, but now we also have this loop which also goes through the integrations and does this git seek ref uh, command, which basically it's like the get position switch, but where you specify which scan to use for reference. And you go from, a, again, a scan number, but you also tell it to use the particular integration. And if you have multiple spectral windows, you can also tell it which spectral window to go. And once you run this, uh, you should end up with a file oh, sorry, and then save every one of these uh, position switch uh, process spectra. And then you end up with something that, that should have data calibrated for each integration and each scan. And then you can pass that to the GVT graph creator, which basically will take this cube of uh, scans and integrations and put them together into a, a 3D representation of your data where you have the two spatial positions and third dimension with the spectral dimension. You can see more about the grider in its GitHub page. Unfortunately, there's not an official documentation for it, but like Larry sh just showed us, we can use this minus H option to learn about some of the options you can pass to it, like the number of channels you want to process, or the channel range, sorry, if you want to average these channels, or if you want to uh, suppress the generation of certain output, or uh, how do you want to call this thing, and also what your business input. So, um, yeah, uh, just a brief note on continuum. Um, it's very important to take into consideration that um, if you want to minimize this one or f noise uh, by picking the right receiver, integration time, and zero rate. Um, there is no like, officially supported continuum at relation package, but if you ask your friend, we can point you to uh, some data reduction scripts that handle continue. And that's what I have to say about that. And we can leave it at this uh, piece of time. We have uh, five minutes over, so I'm going to Are there any additional questions? Thanks, Pedro. Um, We're still waiting on the Pulsar folks to get back to you, so. Okay. If there are a couple questions you can field okay. those. If there's one more thing I wanted to mention, just that there's this thing called the GVT pipeline. So basically, uh, instead of having to write with these scripts yourself, there's already a pipeline out there uh, with a mainly in Python. It was designed for processing observations with the K band focal plane array. But it also works with other receivers that use noise diodes. Um, though you have to be careful about uh, which default values you give it because uh, the default values are for KFDA observations. Um, 
how you would use it from one of the GUT machines, or if you have installed it in your local computer, you call it, you give it an input file, you tell it uh, which scans uh, contain the mapping data, and which scans to use as a reference. And this one is uh, documented on uh, this uh, wiki site, and there's also how you can get the code at, uh, on this website. talk about a bit uh, what the data format is uh, for storing the data. It's called uh, STFIX. It stands for single dish fix files. Uh, it's a default uh, input uh, and output method used by observatory uh, for spectral line observations with Vegas and DCR observations. It's also uh, recognized by QT IDL and the grider and the pipeline. Um, so this is also uh, well documented um, and it's basically just a fix file but instead of having image uh, data it's just table data with uh, the same columns that Larry was showing in his previous talk. And that was uh, pretty much all I wanted to cover with you today. I, I have a question it's about mapping because so I've mm -hmm. never done it. And so is it also a SD fits file? Can you, like, like this visualizer, what you use to make a, a map? Oh, yeah, sorry. The, once you use the grider, it will produce a, a regular fits file. So basically two spatial coordinates and a spectral coordinate. And you could visualize that uh, either using DS9, or I think that they should also be compatible with tools like uh, the CASA viewer. They can correct me if I'm mistaken. But I would normally just visualize them using uh, FDS9 or uh, open them with Python and then analyzing the data from there. OK, thank you. Mm -hmm. wait for the pulsar folks to come back um, and then uh, let's keep going a bit about uh, these two receivers Argus and the W1 receiver which do not use uh, noise diodes but they actually use hot and cold loads um, what does this mean is that uh, instead of having a, a electronic device that generates a, a noise at a certain temperature uh, these receivers actually look at a piece of material or at a mirror that it's uh, at the ambient temperature in the case of the material blocking one of these windows or at a cold temperature. Uh, basically, you put a mirror on top of one of these holes, so then the, the receiver looks back at the cryostat, so it's if the, the temperature, the cold temperature. And you can also use this information to calibrate uh, your data. Um, the equations are a bit different, but the principle is basically the same. So if you were to start from the equations we had at the very beginning, you could also arrive at these uh, uh, definitions of how to get the telescope gain, in which uh, in this case we're using uh, two, uh, yeah, two different temperatures, the ambient temperature and the cold temperature. Uh, to calibrate the receiver. Um, if you're interested, uh, Dave describes this very well in the this memo 302. He describes the calibration of Argus on the W1 receivers. But if you look at the the end equation here, the end result, it's basically the same uh, equation we had before for the uh, receivers with noise and diodes. Uh, the main differences are in how you get the gain and the system temperature. 
if you only have one um, one basically a reference uh, a temperature source, the ambient temperature, the calibration again follows the same equation. In this case, we're talking about the uh, this TA star, which has already been corrected for the atmospheric uh, emission. It's uh, very neat. And uh, you get the, the temperature of the calibrator in a slightly different fashion than, than before, uh, taking into account the temperature of the atmosphere, the background, and you would also need to take into account the opacity at the zenith and the air mass for which you were observing. Um, but for most conditions, this uh, basically reduces to uh, the calibrated temperature, it's basically the ambient temperature, so let's say uh, if you're close to uh, zero degrees Celsius, uh, it should be roughly 273 Kelvin. All right, thank you very much, Pedro, and thank you, Ryan, for the Pulsar talk. Um, we will now go into a quick workshop on connections. And while Andrew Seymour is speaking, I will send everyone um, information on how you will connect. So if you respond to me immediately in the Zoom window, it may get lost because I'm going to have a different thread for every person. So um, Andrew Seymour is a scientist here at the Green Bank Observatory and I'll let him take it away.